I love to watch movies, and after school, I would love to. I love those after school specials, and I grew up in the '90s, and. After school, I would get home, and there was one program I had to watch, Batman. <laughs> Batman on Fox. The animated series, which in my opinion, is still the best series. I love the stories of heroes and villains like Batman and Superman and Iron Man and Anakin Skywalker who also became Darth Vader. And I remember when I was in high school, there was a whole musical about a villain. Wicked. Have you ever, ever heard of Wicked? It's a musical about the Wicked Witch of the West. And, it, and what it does is it actually shows the progression of what happened in the witch's life that led her to be the witch, so it's a more human portrait of her. What do all of these characters, both heroes and villains, have in common? Well, first off, there was a significant event that happened in their life which changed the course of their life. So for an example, in the story of Batman, does anyone remember what was the significant event that happened in Bruce Wayne's life? His parents were killed. Yes, his parents were killed. For Superman, it was his planet was destroyed, and so he his mom sent him down to Earth. For Anakin Skywalker, well that's a whole nother story. <laughs> That's almost nine movies worth, I believe, of storytelling. But the turn from the, the Jedi Knight into the Sith Lord um, was through the, the death, or the threat of death of his wife, Padme. All of these heroes and all of these villains had a choice of how they would respond and react to the things that happened in their life. And their decisions came with consequences, right? In fact, as a general rule of thumb, all of our decisions come with some kind of consequence. Now, sometimes it could be a good consequence, and sometimes it could be a bad consequence, but it happens. And when, when you look at the stories of these heroes, and, and these villains, you can kind of see our own story wrapped up in their stories. You can see where, how we would have responded in a similar way, although we probably wouldn't have put on a cape and, done, and jumped on buildings, certainly not jump on buildings. But we can see the humanity within these people who seem larger than life, because the decisions that they made came with consequences. And sometimes there's mistakes. Um, some mistakes can be um, small, like I, I noticed I made a mistake on the PowerPoint where tail and toil or something like that, tail instead of toil, or some small mistakes like last night I was preaching and I got so energized that I took out the lights behind me. And some mistakes can be come with big consequences. And that is, is where our story is today, where a decision came at a big with a big consequence, and it changed the course of history. I like to invite your Bible, uh, invite you to open up your Bibles to page two. You should be able to find that in your Bible. A story of origins found in Genesis chapter two, first beginning with fifteen 
and 17. Verse 15 and 17 of chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. You know, as we talk about stories of origins, Israel had their own origin story. And what I, what I, I find so fascinating is if you, if you put this story into Israel's context, into their own lives, and the different kinds of, of stories that were being told from different cultures, you're going to notice some major differences. And there's a reason why. First off, it's important to remember that Israel, as a people, believed in God as a redeemer, the one who rescued them from Egypt, the one who rescued them from oppression, the one who rescued them from abuse and exploitation. And so they knew of God as a redeemer, but the question was, why was there oppression? Why was there abuse? Why was there exploitation? And then there's a twist in Israel's story because later on when they got settled in and when they became comfortable, they became their own worst enemy. They began to exploit other people, the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan. And they began to abuse one another and oppress one another. It's a twist of turns. The abused had become the abuser. The exploited had become the exploiter. And the oppressed had become the oppressor. You know... That is the human story. Where did the darkness come from? And while many other cultures and many different theologies during their time talked about kinds of myths where, you know, basically the king or the pharaoh was a god and could force people to do what they wanted, to force people to build pyramids, to, to bring people into exile and exert their own will because they know what's best. It's not just a, a king or a pharaoh problem. It's a human problem that begins at the very heart of our human existence. But here in this text in Genesis chapter 2, which you and I know so very well, we see a different story. Human being, Adam, was made not to be a slave, but to be a servant, a steward for God and creation. He was to serve to care for the garden to reign over the garden on God's behalf, not to exploit it, not to abuse it or oppress it, but to tend to it. God's aim for humanity was whole, well, and good. We were never born to be slaves. We were never born to oppress. We were never born to exploit we were never born to abuse. So what happened? You know, there are boundaries that come with that role. As we learn in this text, God gave Adam the whole garden to tend to, and he only gave him one rule. 
You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you do, you will die. Some of you who might have kids might know that if you tell your kids not to do something, what do they do? They do it. <laughs> Don't touch the hot stove. They touch it. <laughs> Don't cheat on your homework. Well, this test was really hard. It's amazing how often we as humans stand at the very borderline treading it. God gave humanity a choice. So why was the temptation so strong? Why are we so tempted in our own lives? Well, one of the reasons is we, we feel the need to play God. We feel the need to, to have control over our own lives and why do we want control over our own lives? Because we want the illusion of security. We are afraid. We are afraid that there is not enough, so we store up beyond our need while others have nothing. And we are afraid that we are not enough, so we become suspicious of one another trying to find our place by putting the other person down. That was where the boundary lied. And that's where our story continues in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than other wild animals that the Lord God made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the tree of the, of, that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. I love what Mark Twain said. He said, it was not that Adam ate the apple for the apple's sake, but because it was forbidden. It would have been better for us, oh, infinitely better for us, if the serpent had been forbidden. <laughs> then we would have ate snake. This text reminds us of our own story. One of my favorite videos to watch, and I might have shared this before, was they had a, a group of kids in a room, and they put a marshmallow in front of them. And they said, don't eat the marshmallow. And so they waited. And you could see the agony within each kid. You know, there were some of the boys, they just... In a second, they just took it and ate it. They gave up. And then there, there was a video of a girl. She would like sit on her hands and like wince back and forth, just trying to resist eating the marshmallow. In a way, sometimes when we are tempted, we feel like we are being held back from something that is good. And we don't often know what to do with that. And so here in this text, we meet Eve, the woman. And she's not named at this point in the narrative, by the way. She is not Eve. 
The serpent comes to her, and she is smart. She is aware of the boundary. The serpent says to her, did God say this? And you know what's crazy? The woman is the first person to offer commentary about what God said. She is the first one to interpret what God had said. She said, yes, God did say this. But then if you notice, there's a difference in what she said from what uh, God said. She adds something. She says, and you shall not touch it. Stay. <laughs> she said, you shall not touch it. It's peculiar. She is very adamant about the boundaries. But yet, the serpent is crafty, or crafty. He knows the human heart, and he knows the lure of temptation. Every time I think of this story, I think of the used car salesman that Lynchy probably ran into. Oh, this car is perfectly fine. <laughs> Decisions come with consequences. <laughs> but there are people who, and there are people and forces whose aim is to take us off of the path. Who's, who lure us with clever arguments and, and to create a sense of doubt, a sense of suspicion, to a point that we are willing to cross the boundary. And what I find so fascinating is that Eve kind of enters into that scheme in, in a way that you and I do all the time, which is we rationalize ourselves into a bad decision. Do you know what I mean? It's, there's three things that happened in the story. She saw that it was good for food. Oh, it looks good. She saw that it was a delight to her eyes. And then the last one, which I think was probably the kicker, was that it had the ability to make her wise. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is the one who is the true source of wisdom. God. Seeking wisdom beyond God. We become the masters of our own destiny, drawn into our own world. We become <clears throat> like God. That was the temptation. There was a before uh, Star Trek and before Star Wars, C.S. Lewis actually wrote a space trilogy, which I listened to on an audiobook when I would drive to seminary. And if you like The Lion and Witch in the Wardrobe, you might not like the space trilogy. I don't know. It's pretty out there, but it's very theological. And the second book in his trilogy, uh, Paralandra, talks about a professor named Ransom, which is, there's a significance in his name, who is sent to the planet of uh, Paralandra, which is Venus, because they haven't had, the, that planet has life on it and human form beings, and they haven't experienced the fall. And a man named Weston was going to that planet in order to tempt the woman there just like the serpent tempted Eve in this story. And what I find so fascinating is Weston is a, a, a educated professor I, I, at one of the English schools, I can't remember, it's probably Oxford. He was, a, he was a intellectual, but yet he was barbaric. In fact, one of the scariest things that happens in this book is a, is a speech that Weston uh, gives to uh, Ransom, and where he rationalizes himself into madness. He rationalizes himself into darkness. This is what he said, and this is an exact quote from him. Insofar as I am the conductor of the central forward pressure of the universe, I am it. Do you see, you timid, scruple-mongering fool? I am the universe. 
I, Weston, am your God and your devil. I call that force into me completely. Now, I tell you, the first time I heard that, I was scared. <laughs> and what's so fascinating is this was written in 1938. Everyone is bustling about human progress. And so basically this Western character is taking the progress of Western civilization to a, a whole nother progress to the point that it becomes demonic. In fact, immediately when Weston says this, a demon possesses him. Now, sounds like a very a, a good bedtime storybook, I know. <laughs> but yet, that is the story of darkness. That is the story of how we rationalize ourselves into making that decision that has a consequence. And there are consequences because the serpent, he was right in the way that Adam and Eve did not physically die, but there's more than one way to die, right? First off, there was a death of bliss. Their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked. They became suspicious. They became Exposed, they experienced shame, shame with one another and shame with God. They realized that what was meant for good also had the potential for abuse. And then they do what you and I do so often. We blame one another. Can I get a witness? <laughs> God comes into the garden and says, did you eat of the fruit? And what does Adam say? The woman that you gave me. Who did Adam blame? God, why did you put this woman in my life? <laughs> She's the one who did this. He blames God first, and then he blames the woman. And then the woman blames the serpent. And I might have shared this before, but when, uh, when Lindsay and I started dating, she told me that if you point one finger at the other, you're pointing three others at yourself. <laughs> How often do we blame other people for our own decisions? But Lent is the time in which we own up. It is the time in which we get real. We're willing to confront our own darkness, our own temptation, to be honest with ourselves and to be honest with God. Death comes in many different forms, and yet how tragic this is there is still good news within this text. Because even in the tragedy of flawed humanity, they are still cherished by God. And there are hints of it. First off, God comes into the garden and he looks for them. He asks, where are you? And then when it is discovered what happens, God provides them clothing to cover their shame. And Eve receives her name, mother of all living. Everything fell apart, but their story was not yet done. There was still hope. John Milton wrote a famous book called Paradise Lost. And at the very end of the book, there's this beautiful description of the journey that Adam and Eve had before them. This is what he says at the end of Paradise Lost. The world was before them where to choose. Their place of rest and providence, their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took their solitary way. 
two broken people walk hand in hand together because it's only Genesis chapter 3. You still have a whole lot of Bible to get through because the story is not done yet. The story is going to unfold about how God would bring about life in the midst of death. And Lent reminds us that just as you and I own up to our own darkness, Jesus entered into our darkness. That Jesus took on our darkness on the cross. Jesus was abused. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was exploited and oppressed and murdered in order to break hold of the darkness in our lives. A man falls into a pit. He hears many different individuals and groups tell him how to get out of the pit. Buddha says, your pit is only a state of mind. A Hindu says, this pit is for purging you and making you more perfect. A federal bureaucrat says, have you paid taxes on that pit? And a county inspector said, do you have a permit for that pit? But Jesus, seeing the man, reaches down and pulls him out of the pit. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 5 that just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to the justification of all. Just as sin exercised dominion and death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus our Lord. That is what this Lenten season means. That is why we tell the story. That is why we begin by owning our darkness. Because in owning our darkness, we see Jesus there ready to pull us from it, ready to redeem our lives. And that is why we meet at the table today. Will you pray with me? Lord, just like Adam and Eve, our own lives have been marred by our own, our own decisions. We knew that we were created for life, that we were created for a purpose within your creation. And it was good. Lord, forgive us for the mess that we've made. We own up to our darkness. And it is, and we believe and confess that it is in Jesus that that darkness has been conquered. We pray, Lord, that you'll meet us here as we gather at this table in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.